Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Allen Temple, for hosting tonight's event. Thank you, sponsors and contributors, for your support. We appreciate working with Merritt College to co-produce the Barbara Lee and Ellie Hugh Harris Lecture Series. The staff and students of the Freedom Center thank the members of our board for all your support to the Freedom Center. I am honored to be chosen by my peers to represent the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center. It's especially significant for me because next year I will not be in Oakland. I've been a part of the Freedom Center since I was in the ninth grade. And currently, I'm a sophomore at Merritt College. And in the fall, I'll be transferring to a college in Texas. Excuse me. <laughs> and it, it, it's, a, it, it's significant for me because in no way would this be possible uh, if without the, the, the coaching and the, the, the love and the support from not only my family, but the Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center. I particularly want to thank the leadership of the Freedom Center for their dedicated attention to work and study that is necessary to prepare ourselves to be the young men and women we are meant to be. Our lives in the United States are assaulted by what Dr. King called the triplets of injustice, racism, materialism, and militarism. Racism divides. It creates a sense of superiority in members of a particular race. And at the same time, it forms a sense of inferiority Racism is the exceptional us and the irrelevant them. Materialism, materialism makes the I the center of the universe. It puts the object before the individual. It creates a false sense of exceptionalism. Materialism marks the essence of US foreign policy. But it's not just war abroad that threatens our existence. Here at home, violence destroys families and communities. Domestic violence, psychological violence, economic violence, structural violence. Bullying and gun violence plagues us like an infectious virus. We must confront the triplets of injustice with courage and cooperation. The Martin Luther King Jr. Freedom Center works to empower individuals and organizations to create a vision of a more just nation and world and to develop and sustain within themselves the strength, the hope, the leadership, and the organizational integrity to bring about that vision. The Freedom Center uses a coaching model to integrate individuals into civic action and advocacy. Students study and put into action directives issued by Dr. King and other revolutionaries. Dr. King teaches us to study the levers of power. He directs us to develop a tender heart, but he also insists that we keep our minds clear of false ideas and capable of hard and tough thinking. We study the difficult art of nonviolence. Nonviolence is not passive. It is not cowardice, nor is it the submissive surrender to circumstance. It is the courage to confront selfishness and greed. Nonviolence offers us, us all, a particular way of living in dark times without dark times living in us. 
We can. We can reduce the divides between the majority of us and the small sliver that make up the super rich. And of course, we can study war no more. Thank you. Sherry, thank you very much. For those of you who don't know, when Sherry was a reporter at KPIX, and even since she's left there, she's always made herself available to this community for these kind of endeavors or anywhere where she can be of service. So I want you to give her a round of applause. I want to thank Mrs. Fike and the Allen Temple Choir for reminding us about what the great a church is and when you hear that kind of music and you don't know you're in church, you are very confused. <laughs> For some of the young people here who don't remember how long church used to be, <laughs> it can be a very long day. I remember at St. John's Missionary Baptist Church on Market Street, uh, when you went in there in the morning, they didn't let you leave. And they had fried chicken dinners on the side. You could go through a side door. You still did not get out until that evening. Let me say to the pastor and assistant pastor, to the clergy who were here, and certainly to all of the honored guests and all of the friends and supporters of the Martin Luther King Freedom, Freedom Center, how happy I am that you are all here this evening. Because this is really a particularly important evening in the history of this lecture series. I want to tell you why. For many of us who grew up during the Civil Rights Movement, we understand that some should be reminded, others need to be educated about how we got here this evening. I was inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and by, to go into, be a service to my community. And I understood the sacrifice. Uh, when I was growing up, I didn't think I'd get to be over 40 years old, because I believed that if you stood up for anything that was important, you'd be killed. Same thing was true of Jack Kennedy. He was my inspiration to get into politics. He and others who come before me in political life demonstrated that you can make a change if you have a commitment to making a difference. But I want to tell you that when Martin Luther King came to the Bay Area, I did not have a chance to meet him. But my father owned a funeral home, and he had a limousine, so they asked him to drive him around. <laughs> we didn't have limousine services back in those days. But it's important for us to recognize and be reminded that those who come before us, those who serve now, and the young people like Jabari who will lead us in the future, are all important to who we are and who we want to become. And for generations yet unborn, we must always remember and dedicate ourselves to making a difference during our short time here on Earth. We started this lecture series, it was really because we knew that so many people had really not reflected upon how we got to where we're at. And that we will in fact lose the gains that have been made because of the sacrifices of people like Dr. King and many of those who appeared at this lecture series. We will not only lose our way and lose our minds, we will also lose our future. So today we want to take the time to listen to not only a, a great man in his own right, but someone who represents the legacy, not only through his own activism, but through his continued commitment to making a difference in his own life. We were talking backstage, and he was mentioning to Congresswoman Lee that uh, she wasn't in office when he was a supervisor, 
uh, down in Atlanta. And uh, I told Barbara, yeah, I was in office when he was uh, a supervisor in Atlanta. And Barbara said, well, if you'd gotten out of that assembly seat sooner, I would have been in office by then. <laughs> She, and I might have been president by now. <laughs> the one thing you do, wanna, do not want to do is be in Barbara Lee's way. <laughs> I don't know if you heard recently uh, the comments that Barbara has made about Paul Ryan. Yeah. And for that, she was accused by Bill O'Reilly being a race hustler. Well, I don't want to tell you what I think about Bill O'Reilly. It's not while I'm in church. <laughs> but Barbara continues to get death threats and all manner of vile comment because she stands up for us. And sometimes we forget, Barbara Lee is not just a local congresswoman, she is a national congresswoman. She represents people who are un, un, unjustly imprisoned, people who are in poverty, women who are being underrepresented. Uh, she represents everyone in, in life who we want to be represented by someone with the ethics, the integrity, the commitment, and the love that Barbara Lee represents in the U.S. Congress. I've known Barbara Lee for over 40 years, and she's always been the same person she is today. She represents humility, but she represents a type of respect for others that I think draws others to respect her equally as well. So I want you to welcome, with all of the energy and enthusiasm you can, a woman who not only represents us, but makes us proud, Congresswoman Barbara Lee. First, give an honor to God from whom all blessings fall. Thank you, Elihu. Where, where are you, Elihu? I got to thank you for your gracious introduction, but also for your friendship and for continuing to work for justice and for peace and for continuing to work to make this community a better place. You know, Elihu, former assemblyman, mayor, Chancellor Peralta, he could be doing a lot of other things. But instead, he's still working with our young people, with Peralta, trying to make this community a better place. So thank you, Elihu, so much for staying the course, for staying the course. But Sherry, I just have to thank you for once again being with us. You are truly a phenomenal woman who continues to break so many glass ceilings. Thank you, my sister. And of course, it's so good to be home with my pastor, in my home church, Pastor Smith, our great, wonderful assistant pastor, Reverend Jacqueline Thompson, Pastor Emeritus, Reverend Bernstein Smith, Mrs. Elaine Smith, to my entire Allen Temple family. Let me just say, uh, Pastor Smith, you know, I was thinking, you know, tonight, tonight is really not necessarily a lect lecture series, but it is, it's a mass meeting. Remember during the movement, we had mass meetings at churches? Remember that? Well, Allen Temple, I just have to say, Pastor Smith, really um, exemplifies the purpose of the civil rights movement. Through all of its ministries, uh, through your inspirational and your prayerful and your visionary leadership, I'm so proud to call Allen Temple my home church. Thank you so much. 
Permit me for just a few minutes to acknowledge some of those who have made this evening possible for us. First, the Martin Luther King Freedom Center and our magnificent young people who have gone, these young people here, they have gone with me every year on the civil rights pilgrimages to Alabama. And this year, actually next week, they're participating with me in Memphis, Tennessee, in the reopening of the Civil Rights Museum, commemor the commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the signing of the Civil Rights Law, and remembering on April 4th the tragic death of our drum major for justice, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. So these young people, these young people participate in so much of what our work is in seeking liberty and justice for all. So give them another round of applause. And Karen and Roy, I want to thank the directors, the board, the staff, Sandra Andrews, all of our volunteers and our sponsors. Thank you all so much. To Mayor Kwan, I, I have to just say, Mayor Kwan is my mayor, and she continues to make Oakland really the best city in the country to live. And I just have to say that, and I have to say to all of our city council members and public officials, you make me very proud of this great city. To Dr. Ambrise Galaviz and to the Merritt College family, thank you. Without Merritt College and your leadership and commitment, these lecture series would not happen. So we really appreciate you and educating our young people and our older people in this community. And to the Allen Temple Unity Choir and to Betty, one of the lead singers during the Civil Rights Movement. I tell you, she is a renowned jazz and gospel singer who I love, respect, and admire. And I've gotten to know Betty throughout the years during our Civil Rights pilgrimages in Alabama. So thank you, Betty, and thank you, Unity Choir, for lifting our spirits tonight with your beautiful music. Thank you, my sister. And of course, to all of you who continue to be the most enlightened and progressive constituency in the entire country, I am so glad to be home and be, so glad to be with you on this momentous occasion. Let me also, where's Benny Ivey and John Ivey? Just welcome home. Benny Ivey, you know the Ivey family. Benny now works as a senior advisor to Martin Luther King III, and she's with us tonight from Atlanta. And we're so happy to see you, Benny and John. Just a quick bit of history on the Freedom Center. The Martin Luther King Freedom Center, I want you to listen because this center has withstood the test of time. It was born out of the dreams of the East Oakland community, led by our local senior citizen heroes, Mr. Ira Jenkins, who now resides in Detroit, Michigan, and also Charlie Mae Davis, who, while in her 90s, is still an active member of our community. Now, the East Oakland community brought this idea to me while I was in the California legislature and to Elihu when Elihu was mayor. I authored legislation that created an agreement between the city of Oakland, the East Bay Regional Park District, whose involvement was then inspired and still by Doug Seiden, a director of the East Bay Regional Park District, the California State Coastal Conservancy, and the Martin Luther King Jr. March and Rally Committee. Now this was legislation, mind you, that I introduced, and members of the East Oakland community, senior citizens and young people came to Sacramento to lobby for the passage of the legislation that established the Martin Luther King Freedom Center. And guess what? Then Governor Pete Wilson had no option but to sign the legislation. <laughs> no option. <laughs> no option. The mission of this regional center, now this was in the mid-90s, the mission of this regional center was and continues to be a center for young people dedicated to Dr. King's ideals of nonviolence, social change, racial and economic justice, and a peaceful world so that they can become our future leaders grounded in these values and philosophy. And I think you heard Jabari tonight. I think the center's doing a fine job. There are many, many Jabars with the center. 
And so tonight, we are very blessed to have such a special dignitary and one who has seized the torch lit by his parents, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Mrs. Coretta Scott King, as our guest, Martin Luther King III. Now, Martin is dedicated to creating and implementing strategic nonviolent action to rid the world of social, political, and economic injustice. He is an ardent advocate for the poor, the oppressed, and the disillusioned. A graduate of his father's alma mater, Morehouse College, Mr. King was elected to political office in 1986 as an at-large representative of over 700,000 residents in Fulton County, Georgia. Now that's about the same population as a congressional district. He was instrumental in making life so much better for his constituents. Martin King is committed to the positive development of our youth and has initiated several programs to support and nurture young people, including Hopes for Health, which is a charity basketball game held to increase awareness of newborns suffering the effects of substance abuse. And Martin, yeah, you know, he's on the ground doing this work while he's traveling the world teaching the principles of nonviolence. He joins President Obama, myself, and the Congressional Black Caucus in a call for an urgent action to address the issues of men and boys of color through his program, A Call to Manhood, which is an annual event designed to unite young African-American males with positive adult role models. Again, a visionary leading the way. Martin understands and utilizes nonviolent tactics made so important in this country by his parents. Through quiet diplomacy, mind you, he reached a compromise with Georgia's legislators to change the state flag, I don't know if you remember that, which was really an offensive and divisive symbol for many. He led that effort. In 1985, yes, he led that effort. And of course, he thinks locally and acts globally. In 1985, Martin was arrested at the South African Embassy in Washington, D.C. as part of a civil disobedience protest against apartheid and for the release of our freedom fighter, our beloved Nelson Mandela. Mr. King, give him a round of applause for his international work. He's also a former president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, SCLC. Founded by his father, Dr. King, the late Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth, Bayard Rustin, and the Reverend Ab Ralph Abernathy. This was in 1957 when they founded SCLC. But Martin continues to aggressively fight injustice on so many fronts. In 2006, he founded Realizing the Dream, which merged with the King Center in 2010. But Realizing the Dream, he has traveled throughout the world talking about conducting workshops and conferences and preaching and teaching the principles of nonviolence and leadership development. In 2008, Martin spoke at the Democratic Party convention, and I was right there, right there, and it was such an honor to hear you speak, and I, was so, I knew then Barack was going to win. Then Senator Barack Obama, he spoke at that convention, which was the day of the 45th anniversary of the historic I Have a Dream speech given by his father. Martin said, and this was at the convention, he said his father would be proud of Barack Obama, proud of the party that nominated him, and proud of the America that will elect him. Now that's what he said in 2008. He said that. And um, just personally, I just have to say Martin was my keynote speaker when I was sworn in as chair of the Congressional Black Caucus. He spoke for me. And he set the tone for my agenda for two years with the Black Caucus to focus on pathways out of poverty. Martin III, like his parents, is a true leader in the fight to eradicate poverty and to realize the dream for all God's children. And so I am certain that his mother and his father are proud of the work 
that their son is taking, that their son is doing, excuse me, and taking this baton and moving forward as an effective champion for peace and justice, which he is. He will come up in just a minute, and I tell you, I want you to give him a 13th Congressional District resounding <laughs> love, applause, and then the next voice you will hear, is that how we do it at church? The next voice you will hear <laughs> will be Martin Luther King III. Thank you again, and God bless you. That's right. Uh, let me thank God first for bringing us all safely to Allen Temple this evening. And I hope and pray that our returns home will be equally as safe. First, Pastor Smith and the first family and all assistant associate pastors of Allen Temple, as well as all spiritual and religious leaders of this community. To all of our elected officials that represent this community, and of course, obviously, especially to the Honorable Barbara Lee and the Honorable Ellie U. Harris, which this lecture series is named in honor of. Uh, to members and friends of Allen Temple Baptist Church. But probably, perhaps most of all, to the children. For earlier I said, and I always say, that a nation is judged by how it treats its most precious resource. And our most precious resource is certainly our children. Uh, Madam Mayor, also. Uh, just a couple things I want to do before I begin. Benny Ivey and, and John have already, uh, John being in this community, Benny growing up in this community, working with my mother for over 20 years, and now fortunate to have her expertise uh, working with me. And it's, it's wonderful to have a great team. You see, uh, teams win. Individuals sometimes get credit, but it is because they have teams that make them successful. And John has taken me probably where I didn't need to go to every good restaurant in this town. Uh, <laughs> but I have enjoyed myself in Oakland. <laughs> uh, let me also ask uh, Dr. Claiborne Carson and his lovely wife to please stand briefly. Dr. Carson, you may know, um, is a professor at Stanford University and was chosen by my mom to put together uh, the scholarly works of Martin Luther King, Jr. And he's been working on that project for over 20 years, and uh, there will be, I believe, 14 volumes, and there are about eight of them done now. Each one of the volumes is over 1,000 pages. Now, we know Martin Luther King Jr. as a great human and civil rights leader, as a great preacher. But once this project is completed, it will be cemented that he also was a great scholar, one of the great scholars of our time. This, uh, this evening, uh, I guess I'm supposed to talk about what my father's legacy, my father's legacy and what it means for America today. And I want to start by saying that my dad and mom dedicated their lives uh, to the eradication of three things, and Jabari talked about some of them but the eradication of poverty, racism, 
militarism and violence in our society. Now, if we just look at where we are as a society, we've not yet arrived. We see some thought when President Obama was elected that we had arrived. They call us a post-racial society. And after six years, almost, we see really how divided this country really is around race. Now, now, let me remind you, that doesn't mean we had made progress on race. It just means that we are nowhere near where we need to be. And let, let me say something now before I forget about what Congresswoman Lee said. Uh, some of you may remember Dr. Charles King, who was a, a psychiatrist, and he used to do racial sensitivity sessions. And um, he used to say that black folk can't really create institutional racism. We can have prejudice and racial views, but we really can't be racist. Now, let me explain that give you a definition of racism. His definition of racism was, he said, we all are prejudiced. Prejudice means to prejudge. But when we use our racism to oppress others, that's when it becomes true racism. And see, black folk, all black folk in America, there's nothing that we can do that it can affect all white folk. White institutions do stuff every day that impacts us. So by Dr. Charles King's definition, we really can't be racist. We can have prejudiced views and, and that kind of thing. And, and yes, we can spew out even prejudiced thoughts, which we should not. But we don't have the ability to institutionally impact all people across the board. At least now we could because we spent a trillion dollars last year. Black Americans, a trillion dollars. And yet we don't have one black bank with a billion dollars in this country. And so at some point, we got to stop saying we're victims and, 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 and blaming folk. When, you know, you can't say, give me freedom, and you don't even want to walk across the street to vote for your freedom. Something is wrong with that. But yes, yes, it is true that some elements of society have their foots on our necks. But we are people as a community that have risen, and this community is so diverse. It is certainly African Americans, it is Latino and Hispanic Americans, it's Asian Americans, and, and it's white Americans, European Americans. This is a, a wonderful city, progressive city. And I, you know, the Congresswoman said it's because of, I'm going to get in trouble, did not say it that way. It, it's, it's a combination. It is because of the leadership that the congresswoman and others have provided that makes this a progressive community. Because, see, you know, leaders have to lead. They can't sit back and be, uh, you can't be a, head, a taillight. You got to be a headlight. You got to shine your spotlight. And, 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 and when I think about this congresswoman, I, I always think about that vote that she took singularly. And this is not to disparage any of our colleagues, but there were others. They all had agreed, yeah, we're going to do that. But they, they, they didn't have the courage. But she had the courage to stand up against war and injustice. Only one. And 435 members of Congress, uh, she was the only one that stood up. If she did nothing else, my God, we owe her a great debt of gratitude. But she continues to fight for our communities. Our communities, not just communities of color, but wherever people are mistreated in our nation and around the world, Congresswoman Lee will be there every day, each and every day. I, I feel bad for some of our members of Congress because it's hard to work with those folks. I mean, it's, it's, it's a challenge. 
And so you have to find a way to, to love and respect those who don't respect you. And so we've got a tough road to row. But I would adventure to say that if we were doing the job that we should be doing, and I don't mean just here in Oakland, I mean all over America, if we were voting like we vote in presidential election years. We voted more, we voted 62%, I forget, I believe it was, in, in the last election for President Obama, more than the majority community voted. But when it comes to this off year elections, we, we drop off, like the plague. And it's just really tragic and unfortunate. We can and we must do better. Now, going back to what Dad wanted to achieve, I said he focused on, wanted to eradicate race from our society. We got to keep working on that. We've done okay. But when we look at poverty and militarism and violence, poverty, oh my gosh, poverty has grown tremendously and continues to grow. Nearly 60 million people living in poverty. In 1963, 50 years ago, there were uh, about uh, 20, less than 20 million people living in poverty. So yes, our numbers have grown, but those who live in poverty have grown. Many people had just climbed out of the roles of poverty by acquiring homes. And then a foreclosure crisis occurred. And what I don't understand is, is, is the fact that when they qualified many individuals, they knew that people in a couple to three years wouldn't be able to pay those notes. Why? Because if your note jumped from $800 to $1,000 to $3,000 and your salary stayed the same, there's no way. They knew when they did it, those lending institutions, those lawyers, though even the people who appraise our homes, they all participated in short-term gain for themselves, but they've created long-term pain for our nation. It's interesting because nobody's been prosecuted. And the banks just continue to get bigger and bigger. And they're making profits now. You know, the president first bailed out the, the banks, may not have been this order, and then the auto industry. And all that's good had to do that. And those industries have paid back those loans, billions of dollars, over $700 billion plus interest. So that was a good investment. But the question I'd have is, it's all right to bail out Wall Street and to bail out the auto industry, but when are you gonna get to my house and your house? That, that's, that's what we need to be focused on. How do we create opportunities and options for so many who are excluded from the process? We live in a nation that has a criminal system business. It's not a just system. It's a criminal system. It's not just because if it was just, then we wouldn't have nearly 3 million people in there, and most of them are people of color. Richard Pryor captured it many years ago. You go down to the courthouse looking for justice, and all you'll find is just us. And, and that's a sad commentary, one we must change. But guess what? There's a dual responsibility. In our community, we have a responsibility because biblically, it says if you train up a child in the way that they should go, when that child is old, they will not depart from that training. So some in our society have abandoned their responsibility of training up our children. And then there's a second part. The government's problem is there's not, there are not enough indigent defense counselors or attorneys. We need more indigent defense uh, counselors and attorneys for the poor in our nation because most people can't get justice. That's why I say it's not a criminal justice. It's a criminal system, but I'm not suggesting that all the folks there are there who are of criminals. This state knows better than anyone else. With all the prisons you all have, some of them traded on the stock market, just like Texas and some of the other states. It's the new Jim Crow, the new slavery, slavery all over again, the prison system. Many in jail for nonviolent crimes. They should not be there. Now, now there, there are some folks who do belong there, but, 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 but many are there who should not be there. I mean, we are God's highest creation. And 
yet when we get ready to resolve conflict, we operate at the lowest level, lower animal forms. I mean, man has the ability to reason and think. And yet when, 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 when you, you know, you've you never seen a, a group of monkeys talking about Shakespeare and Plato, Euripides. And they, they don't have that ability. You, you, you've never seen a, a, a group of lions, you, you know, t saying, I'm Christian, uh, uh, I'm Muslim, uh, uh, I'm Jewish, I'm, I'm atheist, I'm agnostic. They don't, they don't have that ability. You, 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 you never seen a group of cats talking about I'm Democrat, I'm Republican, I'm Tea Party, I'm Independent. They don't have that ability, but humankind has that ability, and yet when we get ready to resolve our conflict, we resort to the lowest animal form. I'm going to get him. And we're going to pull out something and shoot somebody. We got a Congress that won't even, won't even pass gun legislation. How sad is that? I mean, I just knew after Sandy Hook, I mean, many of us have been fighting for some level of gun control for many years. I just knew after little white children were killed that America was going to say, we got to do something. We got to do something. Nope. Not yet. No, they're scared of the National Rifle Association. I mean, why do you even need an assault rifle? Why? I mean, for those people who hunt and believe in guns, why, why do you need one? I mean, even if you're hunting, it's really not fair to the animals. I mean, think about that. You got a gun to shoot out 100 bullets in a second. I mean, how is that fair? That's not sportsmanship. <laughs> but violence begets violence. And that's what is promoted over and over again. Six out of 10 cartoons are violent. Six out of 10 television programs are violent. Seven out of 10 Video games are about blowing up something and shooting something. And when you go to the theater, six out of ten movies are violent in the theaters. So no wonder our children are violent. They are victims of how they are socialized and what they consume. Until we say we're not going to consume this diet of violence, we will continue to have a society that is violent. But in addition to that, we have to create opportunities. It's not just that. I mean, the fact that in our communities, between the ages of 18 and 35, the unemployment rate hovers around 35, 45 percent. And you wonder, well, why, why are they doing that? Well, they don't have anything to do. Why? Because we let them, first of all, we let them drop out of school. When I was growing up, you couldn't drop out of school. They had people going around making sure you were, they weren't going to let you drop. But now we let them drop out, and they drop out by the time they get to third, fourth, fifth grade. That is sick. And this is one of the greatest nations in the world. How can we abandon our children the way that we are? If, we, see, if Martin King and Coretta King were still here, uh, they, they'd certainly be focused on these issues because, because it only takes a few good women and men to bring about change. It really doesn't take masses. Yes, we saw the March on Washington where there are 250,000 people. In fact, last year, was a year of significant anniversaries, and this year is also. Last year was the 50th anniversary of the tragic death of Medgar Evers. Last year was the 50th anniversary of my dad writing in the letter from the Birmingham jail in 1963, challenging the clergy persons. Last year was the 50th anniversary of certainly the March on Washington, where he delivered that vision for our nation. Yes, it was partially about a dream, but he first talked about a check. And many people missed that part. A check that was sent before the federal treasury, and, and when that check was sent to be cashed, it came back marked insufficient funds. You see, that was the revolutionary part, but they didn't want you to know about that, and so they reversed up to the dream part. Because the dream part is they want you dreaming all the time instead of doing. Because if you're dreaming, you don't have time to do. But you missed the mark. You missed the mark. But it also was the tragic anniversary of the four little girls losing their lives in the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. It was the tragic uh, year of the 50th anniversary of the uh, assassination of President John Kennedy. Uh, and there were a lot of other anniversaries. This year, we will observe the 50th anniversary, Congresswoman Lee already said it, of the Civil Rights Act, the signing of the Civil Rights Act, which gave us citizenship. 
We will observe later on in the year the 50th anniversary of my dad winning the Nobel Prize and talking about peace because, you see, his understanding, he, as long as he was talking about the right to vote, you know, and things like that, people thought he was, knew what he was talking about. That's, I, I, let me say this, those who were thinking people knew that he always knew what he was talking about. But I'm saying, you know, many people say, well, what did, what did Dr. King know about foreign affairs? We got to be over here in this war in Vietnam. April 4th, 1967, he preached a sermon at Riverside Church called Why I Opposed the War on Vietnam. And he talked about how, you know, soldiers' bodies were being used to bring poppy back to America so that heroin could be put on the streets. You know, this is very serious. So, you know, the mob, a lot of folks were mad at him, basically, by 1968. Actually, they were mad before then. But, but you know, uh, the mob was mad at him. The government was upset. The president was even upset because, you know, they had been sort of good friends. And Dad wasn't really personally criticizing the president who inherited the war, President Johnson, but he was criticizing the concept of war. And so, you know, that's why... <laughs> You know, I, I, I'm so grateful to Congresswoman Lee because of her stance on war. You see, we, we, we just keep making more bombs and stuff, and we have enough munitions to blow up the world, I don't know, probably 20 times. It ain't going to take but one. Why we keep manufacturing the stuff? It don't even make no sense. I mean, think about that. Well, we got to keep building. We got to keep, uh, you know, keep people afraid of us. And uh, I was uh, yesterday. This morning, early this morning, probably about 4 o'clock, I was looking at HBO, and a special came on talking about the use of drones. Drones are being used under the auspices of spying on people, and, but they actually are used to identify those that we say are our enemies and then to kill but what you're ending up doing is killing innocent children with these drones, and you make more enemies. Violence begets violence. How do you think you can out-violence and make a society better? It does not work. Only light puts out darkness. They had told us that and taught us that. And so I'm saddened that enough of us have not raised up. And, and constructively said something about what the president is doing. Not because the, the president doesn't have a choice, because the generals are telling him we got to do this. But until the community rises up, so the president can say, well, you know what, I hear what you all saying, but you know, these people on my behind. I can't just do what you're saying. We don't say anything. We just, we're quiet on that issue. That's not who we as Americans are. We are better than that. And so we've got to rise up. And it doesn't mean that you denigrate and, 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 and criticize in a negative way, but we certainly have to challenge. That's what Martin Luther King Jr. would be done, doing. And that's what this center is doing as it is preparing young people so that you challenge the nation to become a better nation. We are a better nation than this behavior that we are exhibiting. I started off talking about this trillion dollars and I was talking about banks. See, one of the things about integration is I don't believe my father wanted us to abandon our institutions. We used to have insurance companies and banks and many other businesses. And we still have some of the businesses, but we just kind of left our business and said, man, this ice over here is colder than, than ice, but it's ice. I mean, how did we get programmed to believe that? There's something wrong there. And all I'm saying is, if we were able to control and have money circulating in our community many times, in our Jewish friends community, money circulates over and over again, 10, 12, maybe 13 times before it leaves. In other communities, money circles four, five, six times before it leaves. In our community, it comes in and it goes back out. And so we've got to do better. Nobody can do that for us but us. We've got to have a consciousness that we are not yet engaging and embracing. That consciousness will cause us to, you know, when you know better, you do better. At least that's what they say. And some, most of us will. Not all. There's always a sampling of, you know, few, few, few fools. Even uh, Pat Smith, even in the church. Not, not here at Allen Temple, but we got a few fools in the church. I mean, there's always a fool or two uh, in the church. So, 
No, but but in, all, in all seriousness, we can and we must do better. My father, as I get close to closing, my father taught us about the value of love and my mom, and they dedicated their lives to that kind of love. My father preached a sermon called Levels of Love, where he talked about the lowest level of love being utilitarian love, excuse, excuse me, uh, being uh, uh, f f defined as, as, as French, uh, yes, utilitarian love, the lowest kind. You know, you love someone as long as you can use them, and when that use runs out, you don't love them anymore. We don't need to just toss that out of the window. Then he talked about friendship love, which is defined by the word phileo. But you love your friend because your friend loves you, so that's not the highest. Then, then he talked about, uh, 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 talked about mother's love, which is so beautiful. A mother's love is, is incredible. Mothers love their children unconditionally. You know, you know how we men are. That, that's my son. What about your wife? I mean, you ain't had and labor pain. I am. But well, that's my son. Whoa. You know, sometimes we say that, but, but that mother's love is so beautiful. Then, then he talked about uh, romantic love, defined by the word eros. Oh, good God, that's a beautiful kind of love. I remember my dad saying this, and when my wife is with me, I often say it. You, you may love the way she looks, or you may love the way she cooks. You may love the way she walks or just the way she talks. You don't know what it is totally, but it just moves you. That's a powerful kind of love, but that's not the highest. My dad talked about humanitarian love, which is so wonderful. In fact, when we exhibit our humanitarian love, we sort of exhibit some of the highest level of love that our nation exhibits because... You know, but you kind of love everything in general and nothing in particular. But whenever there's a tsunami, whenever there's a natural disaster, a catastrophe, Americans roll up their sleeves. Many send money. Many go right to the area because they want to help. They want to make that. They don't ask you, are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? Are you straight or are you gay? It doesn't matter. They're there just to help a soul in trouble. That's when America exhibits its best quite often. But even that is not the highest. He talked about agape. Agape is a love that is totally unselfish and seeks nothing in return. You love someone if they're old, you love them if they're young. You love them if they're black, you love them if they're white. You love them if they're Latino or Hispanic, you love them if they're African. You love them if they're Asian, you love them if they're gay, you love them if they're straight. It does not matter. You love them because you know that God calls you to do that. And that's the kind of love we've got to embrace if we're going to move America forward. These are lessons my mom and dad taught me as a child. These are significant lessons. And I believe that America can learn something from these lessons. Dad used to tell us that in life you must decide whether you're going to be like a thermometer or a thermostat. And you may say, well, Brother King, what does that mean? Well, you see, a thermometer is a good device, but all it does is records the temperature. If it's 70, it'll say 70. If it's 80, it'll say 80. If it's 90, it'll say 90. That's all it does all day long, records the temperature. But there's another device called a thermostat. And if it's too hot, you turn it down. If it's too cold, you turn it up. The thermostat regulates the temperature. And what I'm saying, my friends, this evening is we got to decide if we're just going to record history or be a part of regulating what happens in our lives. <laughs> Dad left us an example, left us a blueprint that we must learn more how to follow. And he taught us how to do it nonviolently, without destroying either person or property. So that can be done. It's already been done. But we just have to learn the example and learn the six steps and the six principles. Because if you learn the six steps and principles, most of our conflicts can be resolved. If you learn, embrace, and live them. So I'm gonna, I really am going to go to my seat. I, I got a little bit more to say. Uh, I lost my speech, so I did, you know... I,
But I just want to leave you with a couple more challenges. You see, I remember traveling with Dad eight or nine times. I traveled with my mom many, many more times than that. But I used to hear him challenging communities, saying, you got to be the best of what you are. He went on to say, when you identify your calling, you must do your job well. Do that job so well that the living, the dead, or the unborn could do that job no better. He went on to say, even in life, if it falls your lot to be a street sweeper, why go on and sweep streets like Michelangelo carved marble? Sweep streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep streets like Shakespeare wrote poetry. Sweep streets like Raphael painted pictures. Sweep streets so well that all the hosts of the heavens and earth would have to pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper that did his job well. The historian Douglas Malick captured it this way by saying, if you cannot be a pine on the top of the hill, just be a shrub in the valley, but be the best little shrub on the side of the road. Be a bush if you cannot be a tree. If you cannot be a highway, just be a trail. If you cannot be the sun, just be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you fail. You've just got to be the best of what you are. That's our challenge. I always close with this story or more times than not. I was very blessed to visit my mom's undergraduate institution, Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio. She took all of her, all my siblings, all of us there. And on that campus, there was a statue of the educator Horace Mann. And on that statue was inscribed some words that made an indelible impact upon my life and continue to. The words say, be ashamed to die unless you've won a victory for humanity. Be ashamed to die unless you've won a victory for humanity. You say, well, Brother King, that's too grandiose. No, you can win a victory in your neighborhood. You can win a victory in your school. You can win a victory in your place of worship. Some of us will win victories in our city. Some may win victories in our state. Others may win victories in our nation. And some will even win victories for our world. But essence, the essence is be ashamed to die until you've done a little something to make the world in which we all must live a little better than it was when you arrived. Thank you and may God bless you, Oakland and Allen Temple, always. I believe so long I believe it's gone so long I believe the storm so long but I try to make heaven my home 